What's up guys? We're going to go ahead and get started with our spring notes. And these notes are going to talk about Hooke's Law as well as spring energy. So first thing I want to do is talk about Hooke's Law. What is it? Well, Hooke's Law just tells us that the extension or stretch of a spring is directly proportional to the force applied to it. So what does that mean? Basically, the more we stretch a spring, the more force we need to stretch it which makes sense, right? If you think about uh, somebody like pulling on a bungee cord or pulling on a rubber band, the further you pull that bungee cord or the further you pull that rubber band, the more force you need to pull it. Here's a little meme for Hook, all right? And then we have Hook's Law Equation. So the equation, because it talks about force, is going to be Fs equals K times X. And let's talk about what those variables are right now. So Fs is force in the spring, and that's measured in newtons, because we know forces are measured in newtons. K is going to stand for the spring constant, and that's going to have the units newtons over meters. And X is going to stand for the stretch or compress distance. So if we were to pull a spring, we would see how far we're stretching it, that would be X. If we were to compress a spring and push it together, then we would measure that distance, and that would be X as well. All right, let's talk about those K values. Well, like we said, K tells us how stretchy a spring is. So a large K value is going to tell us that we have a stiff spring, or in other words, a spring that's going to require a lot of force to stretch. So if I look at my image over here on the left-hand side, I would probably classify the gold spring right here as a stiff spring, as well as this um, kind of brown spring on the right side as another stiff spring. A small K value is going to tell us the opposite, and that's going to tell us that we have a loose spring. So it's going to require very little force needed to stretch. So for instance, this looks like a very loose spring. An idea of that in real life, right, could be the spring in your pen. It takes very little force to push down your pen, so we know that that spring has a small K value. But a stiff spring might be like a trampoline. Those springs require a lot of force to push down right? Or perhaps the springs in a car or the springs on a bike. Those could be stiffer springs. They probably have bigger K values. Here's an image just showing Hooke's Law again. And here we can just see an unstretched spring. And then we notice that as the spring goes down, that we are moved some distance X. And if we want to go twice as far, we need twice as much force. So that's just telling us that force and the distance that a spring stretches are proportional to each other. They are directly related. Next thing I want to talk about is elastic potential energy. And let's define that. So like we said before, elastic potential energy is the energy stored in an elastic object when it is stretched or compressed. And we have an equation for that. And that equation is EPE equals half KX squared. The K and the X still stand for the same thing that they did in our force equation. And that was that K is our spring constant and X is the stretch or compress distance. So let's think about this. Which kind of spring would store more energy, a stiff or a loose spring? Well, if we're looking at our equation here, we know that a stiff spring has a big K value and a loose spring has a small K value. Therefore, the stiff spring is going to store more energy than the loose spring because its K value is a lot bigger. And if we're just thinking about it right in terms of common sense, we can remember that a stiff spring is going to require more force. And for more force, we're going to need to put in more energy for that. Therefore, the stiff spring will store more energy because it requires more force. All right, let's take a look at our first practice problem here. We got our good old friend, Rich. 70 kilograms in case you forgot, and he is jumping off the roof again. He's just a daredevil, he's a crazy guy. And that roof is three meters high. But this time he is landing on a trampoline. The spring constant for the trampoline is 6,000 newtons per meter. Let's assume that there is no air resistance, all right? And let's identify the system. So if we are thinking about the system here. We have Rich, we know that we have a trampoline, we have the garage, and we know that he's on Earth. 
So all those important things are gonna help us identify that. Once we do that, we can go ahead and draw our energy pie charts at the beginning and the end. So here's the system, just like we mentioned, rich, earth, gravity, garage, trampoline. And again, the system is just our way of saying what is important in this problem. So if we're thinking about this problem, at the beginning, Rich is on his garage. There's no air resistance, so all he has initially is height. Therefore, he's going to have a bunch of GPE at the beginning. And at the end, he's landing on the trampoline. And we can say that at the trampoline, height is zero. And when he lands on the trampoline, he's not moving either. Therefore, at the end, the only energy he's going to have is the trampoline being stretched. And because it's a spring, that's going to give us elastic potential energy. Now that we identified those energy pie charts, let's go ahead and try to calculate what the energy is. All right, since we have height and mass, we can calculate GP first. We know that GPE is equal to mass times gravity times height. Our mass is in the problem. It says rich is 70 kilograms. Gravity is on Earth, so that's 9.8. And height is also in the problem. It's 3 meters. Go ahead and multiply all those together, and we find out that GPE is equal to 2,058 joules. Next, since we know that GPE is our only energy to start with, we can say that our total energy is just 2,058 joules. From there, we know that our total in the beginning equals our total at the end. So our EPE is also 2,058 joules because all of that GPE got transferred into EPE at the end. So looking back at our problem, let's just go ahead and fill in our boxes, the amounts of energy of each type. In the beginning, we have 2,058 joules of GPE, zero joules of EPE. Total would be 2,058 joules. At the end, all of that energy is transferred over and we still have the same total, which is 2,058, except now we have 2,058 EPE and zero GPE. Let's say that I want to calculate how far that trampoline stretches. Well, I know what my EPE is, so all I have to do is go ahead and plug that into my equation. I have EPE equals half kx squared. I know that 2058 is my EPE. One half is one half. My K or my spring constant, it was given to me in the problem, is 6000 times x squared. Go ahead and simplify get everything by itself, and then just square root. I find out that x equals 0.83 meters, telling me that my springs are going to stretch 0.83 meters at the end. So now let's just go ahead and recap what we talked about. The equations we mentioned today were force of a spring, and that was Fs equals Kx. And then the other equation was energy of a spring, and that was Epe equals 1 half Kx squared. I just wrote 0.5 there, same thing. The variables, Fs equals force in the spring, which is measured in newtons because it's a force. K equals our spring constant, newtons over meters. And again, that spring constant, if it's big, is a large K, meaning that we have a stiff spring. Therefore, meaning that it's harder to pull, which means that it's gonna require more force, which also means that it is going to store more energy. A small or tiny K we know is going to be a loose spring. And that just means that it's going to be easier to pull, requiring less force. And X is going to stand for stretch slash compress distance. So again, if we were to stretch a spring, we're to pull it apart or compress it, meaning to push it together. And lastly, EPE just stands for elastic potential energy. And we know that that's measured in joules.